Hey, take your Bible out for me. Turn it to Mark chapter eight, and I want to um, I want to use your time wisely. So, um, most of you I've seen before. A lot of you I've seen before. I shouldn't say most because I didn't count how many people I've seen before. For those of you uh, that I have seen before, you know I try to be as raw and as raw thoughts as I can possibly give you. Tonight will be no different. Um, but that means I'm probably going to storytell some, um, which you just got to listen. Cool? How honest with y'all can I be? Can I be completely honest with you? Okay, so um, I was thinking that I was going to share Hebrews with you. And this morning, when I recognized that you are in Mark 8, I was like, okay, Lord, what do you want me to say for Mark 8? And I was in the shower, and he just told me three things that he wants me to share with you this morning. But it came like a Russian wind so quick. That I was like, I didn't have anything to write with in the shower. And so I just, it's in my head. So this is like raw thoughts from this morning from what God told me to tell you. Now, I don't know who you are, and I need to preface this way for this simple fact. It came so strong that somebody in this room, I don't know who you are, you were asking God a question that he is getting ready to answer. And I know that it might be me. <laughs> but I know that just is how it came. But this is what he told me to tell you. Um, so if you're a sermon title person, I'm not the kind of person, but the Lord told me to tell you, I will take care of you. He just said, tell them, I will take care of you. So I don't know who you are. I don't know who in this room is like, but God, will you handle it? God, will you take care of it? He literally said this morning as loud as, not as loud as he could, but as loud as I could hear him, maybe. He said, tell them, I will take care of you. Stop worrying about it. I will take care of you. I promise to take care of you. Cool. All right, Mark chapter 8, I'm going to do, I thought I was going to do just a few verses, but then he told me to do the whole chapter, so we're going to do the whole chapter. Cool? I'm just trying to listen. Right now, I'm on Jesus' coattails. That's what we all. And so this is what the Word of God says. It says, in those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days. They have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their own homes, they will faint on the way, for some of them have come from a very long way. So the disciples answered him, how can one satisfy these people with bread here in the wilderness? He asked them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and gave thanks. He broke them. He gave them to the disciples to set before the people, and they set them before the multitude. They also had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said, set those in front of them. So they all ate, they were filled. They took up seven large baskets of leftover fragments. Now those who had eaten were about 4,000 and he sent them away immediately. He got into a boat with his disciples and he came to this region called Dalmanutha. Um, I'm gonna pray and then I'm just gonna rant for the next however long, cool? <laughs> Father, thank you so much for um, your word. Thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for speaking to me. And I pray that you would speak to all of us. Let it be known that you're God, that I'm your servant, that I'm saying these things according to your word and not my own. Would you hear me so that all of the people in this room would know that you're God and that there's nobody else? Would you answer the questions that people have asked in the privacy of their own homes and bathrooms and closets and wherever else they might have been when they asked? Say stuff that only you could know so that when they walk out of this room, they have to know that you've spoken to them. Pray that you do that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, right off the bat, um, this passage means a lot to me. I'm going to tell you a quick story as to why this passage means a lot to me, and then I'm going to jump into this passage. Cool? Um, this is the quick story. In 2010, uh, while I was working at Summer's Best Two Weeks, for our city kids camp, we were looking for property. And what ended up happening was we found the property. God told us to buy it. And when God told us, I'm skipping a whole lot of stuff. You can always ask me later. I will, I'm happy to give you my number and tell you the whole story. But. The long and short of it is we got $250,000 from a person I have never met. I still haven't met the dude. That's not true. I just met him in September for the first time. I've now known him for a bunch of years. I met him in September. At that time, I had not met him. He gave us $250,000 to buy a property. And when we bought that property, I started freaking out because once you buy a property, you didn't need to raise money to build a camp on the property. So that's what was happening. I need y'all to know that $250,000 came from a person I had not met after an 11-minute conversation on the phone where he gave us money to buy this property. Now we need to raise three and a half million. I say now, this is 2010, we need to raise three and a half million. I've got a good friend whom I just saw in Lancaster, PA now, who was a, I was a disciple at the time. He called me um, that morning that I was on my face, weeping and crying to God, saying, God, how in the world are we gonna raise three and a half million dollars, right? 
I'm going to remind you, I got 250000 from a dude I never met. And I'm on my face literally crying, saying, how in the world are we going to raise $3.5 million? And so Kevin gets on the phone, and Kevin goes, Smart, this, I have a biblical question. Can you answer it? I said, absolutely. Uh, and so he said, hey, man, I'm reading Mark chapter 8, and, and I'm trying to figure out, was the female the 5000 first or the female the 4000 first? I was like, well, if, um, yeah, so yeah, the feeding of the 5,000 was first, feeding the 4,000 was second. You got to read chapter six before you get to chapter eight. And I was kind of making a joke out of it. Like, man, it's in, like, it's in order. So yeah, the feeding of the 5,000. And so Kevin said, having no clue what was happening, Kevin said, then why were they concerned about him feeding 4,000 if he had already fed 5,000 people? And at that moment, I was like, well, the text says that their hearts were hard, and I was convicted immediately, right? Because that morning, I was on my face going, hey, God, how are you going to supply this $3.5 million need when he had just given us $250,000 from a guy I didn't even know that I had just had a conversation with over the phone? I'm telling y'all, that was 2010. Up until September 4th of this year, if, you would, if that dude would have walked into my house, I'd have had no clue who he was. And he has now given way more than I could possibly imagine. Why am I telling you this story? Because God says he will take care of you. You might not know where it's coming from. He does. You don't need to worry about it. So three things he told me to tell you. Are you ready? Thing number one, he said, I am compassionate. Tell them I am compassionate. I know exactly what is going on in your life. I'm not hard hearted, but tell them I'm compassionate. So this text, Jesus says, the Bible says that they hadn't had anything to eat. And Jesus said, I have compassion on this multitude because they have now continued with me for three days. They have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their own houses, they'll faint along the way. For some of them have come from afar. What God told me to tell you this morning while I was in the shower, he said, go and tell them. I know their past. I know their present. I know their future. I know everything about them. I know where they came from. I know their calling. I know their destiny. I know it all. And I will take care of them. Right now, they're not trusting me. Whoever that is, maybe it's me, but I'm talking, I'm talking to me too. But if that's you and you're going, God, how? God, how in the world are you going to do this? He told me to tell you, I know what I'm doing. Right? So these people are hungry. Jesus knows that they're hungry. And Jesus even says, if we send them away, Jesus says what will happen to them. But he says, I don't want that to happen to them. So we're going to fix this right now. We're going to do something else. So if you're thinking, God, you don't know where I am. You don't know what's going on. You don't know how I feel. God, you're asking me a question. God, do you know how I feel? The answer is yes. He knows exactly how you feel. He knows exactly what's going on. In fact, according to Acts chapter 17, he allowed you to be where you are so that you can reach for him and get to know him really, really well. So if you're the person really frustrated with where you are right now, I just need you to know that God is saying, I will take care of you. You don't have to sit there and think about how to fix your situation because I will take care of you. He has compassion on these people who are hungry and even says they've been with me for three days. What's amazing to me is, and again, he's God, so he knows, right? But he tells the disciples how long the people have been there, how they're hungry, what will happen to them if they go walking. And he says some of them came from a long way. Unless Jesus is just sitting there having conversations, again, he's God, he knows, but he knows where every single one of them lives. And because of his compassion, he says, we need to feed these people. That's the first thing he told me to tell you. Second thing he told me to tell you is he's collaborative. So he's compassionate. He knows exactly what your past is, your present, your future. He knows exactly what you are facing. He knows every injury. He knows the injuries that are about to come. He knows the one that you just healed from. He knows the conversation you just had with whoever it was. That made you get to this point. But he's collaborative. He doesn't just want to do it. Listen, Jesus could have come down to earth and died in his sleep. He did not do that. Right? Jesus lived for 33 years. He lived a life and he was tempted at all points. Hebrews 4 says, just like we are, yet he was without sin. So it's not like he doesn't know what you're going through. If you're adopted, he was adopted. If you're a person that doesn't have friends, the Bible literally says there was nothing about him that would make us desire him. That's what it says. And so he's collaborative. He says, um, the disciples actually say, how are we going to do this? Now, I want to remind you, he had just, if not days prior, at least weeks prior, at most weeks prior, fed 5,000 people with two fish and five loaves of bread. And these disciples are going, well, how are you going to do it this time? Now, I want to bang on disciples and say they were idiots. But can I story tell real quick? Can I tell you a story? So I told you, 2010, we get this property, $250,000 from somebody I don't even know. 
We're trying to raise three and a half million dollars to build on this property. This is 2011. I'm in uh, the UPMC building now. It was called the U.S. Steel Building. I'm on the 44th floor. I'm sitting in front of Tom Usher, who was the president and CEO of U.S. Steel. He had built a $21 million facility where he was running camps for kids from Pittsburgh. And in that office, he was sitting uh, like, so I'm here and he's here. And he said, what if we gave you that facility? And I remember looking down at the table and I was like, I don't want to look at him because then he'll recognize what he said. And I'm pretty sure he doesn't know what he just said. He then said, and we'll give it to you, no strings attached. Now, I want to remind you, it was a $21 million facility that he, he built. Had, at that time, four houses on the property. It came with vehicles and everything. He said, what if we just gave it to you to run your ministry? So, so I just want to make sure everybody's tracking. $250,000 from a guy I don't even know. I'm yelling at God for three and a half million. He gives us a $21 million facility that's already built. Right? I'm a walking miracle. Now, you would think, right? You would think I never again in life am saying, God, what you going to do? Right? Because he's provided. I literally wake up. And I live in a $750,000 house that I paid nothing for, right? It belongs to our camp. I go to an office. That's a $650,000 office that I paid nothing for. I walk into a gym every day to walk, work out, a $5 million gym, state of facility. I did nothing to get it. You would think that I would never again sit in my office and cry out to God going, well, what you going to do this time? You would think, because I've seen the feeding of the 5,000, I would never, ever think that God's not going to take care of me. You know what I do a lot of times? I like he did it before, but I don't know that he can, I don't know, he, I don't know that he's doing it again. And I'm going to remind y'all, I didn't do anything to get it. It's not like I was like, there are tons of people that when we got the property, they were like, Timothy, you've been so faithful for years. I'm like, you don't know the conversations I had with God. <laughs> like, you can call it faithful if you want to. I did nothing to get that. But God, by his grace, works collaboratively. He could have just fed the people. He could have just spoke food into existence. He could have just let manna drop. But that's not what he did. What he did is he said, hey, what do you guys have? And, they, and they're going, how are we going to feed all these people? What do you have? You're going, God, how am I going to make this happen? God, how is this going to work? And he might be tonight saying, what do you have? And I want to use what you have. I want to use what's in your hands. The story that you're so afraid to share, that thing that you don't want to talk about, he might be saying, what do you have? And that's your loaves that he's going to use to multiply and then feed the people that are around you. He literally says, how many loaves do you have? They say seven. And then he commands that everybody sit down. And he could have literally, he could have just said, okay, bread multiply, gone, and it's, and it's there in everybody's hands and their mouths. He could have, if he wanted to, snapped his fingers and made everybody satisfied without feeding it. He could have done whatever he wanted. But for whatever reason, and I think I know what the reason is, he broke the bread, and then when he broke the bread, he gave it to his disciples, and his disciples gave it to the people. So he's just sitting there breaking bread and tearing bread, and he's giving it to his disciples. His disciples are giving it to people. It's only seven loaves. We found out later it's 4,000 people there. So I just want you to peep this. Every time somebody else says, I didn't get a piece, a disciple has to walk back to Jesus. Jesus tears a piece of bread, gives it to him. He goes and gives it to those people. And they just keep that, that workflow going until everybody's had enough food, just like he did with the 5,000. But the disciples, he involves in the miracle. So they get to see, look, we only had seven loaves and we have fed all of these people. And then the Bible says that they take up seven baskets worth of food. They also had a few fish, apparently, and so those fish then go and they feed everybody, right? This is ancient Long John Silvers that Jesus makes right then and there. The reason I'm saying that, family, is if I'm going to be completely honest with y'all, we were promised a gift. Somebody, uh, there was a foundation that said they would give us $250,000 in 2024, I'm sorry, 2023, and then they said at the end of 2023, and then they said by March of 2024, they would give us $250,000. March came and went. April came and went. Here we are. We still don't have the $250,000. Now, I'm the CEO of our company, and so I'm looking at our finances, and I'm going, all right. Um, and so we have this investment account. Oh, here's another just crazy story. I don't tell this story all the time, but y'all just need to know. 
So the $21 million facility came. He gave us a million dollars in an investment account on top of the $21 million facility he gave us, just if anything breaks, right? So we have now been using some money from that account. We went years without having to touch it. We've never been using money from that account because we rely on generous donations from people in order to do what we do, right? Because what we, uh, dang it, I'm storytelling. So what we do at City Kids is it costs us $900 per camper. But we see campers from urban areas that wouldn't be able to pay for a $21 million facility. So we only charge them $120. bucks. costs us $900 per camper. So I go out and I raise $780 per child. We see roughly 600 children throughout the summer. So I got to go raise about a million dollars a year in order to make sure that they can continue to come to camp and only pay $120. Everybody following me? So in order for us to get paid, a <laughs> million dollars needs to come in. Or I got to take money from the investment account. So we're taking money from the investment account. We're thinking to ourselves, we only got a year before that's empty. And so my director of finance and I are in a meeting and we are looking at each other like, hey man, God gonna do something, but like he need to, he need to like, he need to come on with the come on. Like he need, we, we keep pulling money from this investment account. And y'all know in an election year, the market is like doing double dutch and all kind of other stuff. And so it's just like nerve wracking. So we're in a meeting and I'm like, hey man, we just need to pray and we just need to trust God with it. And so he starts texting me every week. Hey, have you heard from that foundation? Hey, have you heard from that foundation? Hey, have you heard from that foundation? Hey, have you talked to him? I'm like, man, I'm talking to him as much as I possibly can in every way, shape, or form that I can. I'm emailing them. I'm calling them. I've heard nothing. We had an event on September 4th where I met the guy that I was telling you all about. At that event, I was thinking, man, with the heavy hitters we got in the room, I mean, the, the, the amount of money that was in that room is crazy. So I'm thinking everybody and their mom about to drop us checks and we're going to be fine. And when you start fundraising, um, sometimes what happens, just be honest with you, is somebody that you know could write a check like you never, ever again have to raise money, write you like a thousand dollar check. And you're like, come on, bro. Come on. Come on. This is you pay less than this to get your wheels like done. Like, what are you? So that happens. We get like a few people giving us thousand dollar checks. So we're freaking out at the office. If I'm going to be completely honest with you now. $21 million given to us, $250,000 given to us. I've seen him give us a $700,000 check one morning. I was begging him for stuff. I think I told this story here once. I've seen God do miracles. I've seen God do stuff. And I'm still like, hey, man, what about this time? What about this time? What are you going to do this time? They promised us a check. We haven't seen that check yet. Well, we're draining the investment account. Here's the crazy part. He took care of us with the investment account, too. It's not like we, we bone dry. I'm just nervous because I like having surplus. I don't know if you like me. I like having surplus, right? And so I'm in the office. I'm freaking out. God, what are you going to do? And this dude that I'm telling you about texts me, and he's like, hey, can we talk? And I'm like, sure. So he calls me, and he goes, hey, this new project y'all got called City Kids University. Tell me all about the project. So I tell him all about the project, and he said, hey, I give 50000 every year. We're going to up our gift this year. And I'm like, sweet. They normally give it in December, right? He gave it two weeks ago. And he gave 125000 this time instead of 50000 which is more than what he gave, right? So that check comes in. And then I get a text on my phone. Hey, this other family sent 30000 And I'm like, oh, snap. And then I get a text yesterday. Hey, this other family sent 25000 And then this other lady that I know um, sent 10000 Like, I, I, I was told by the Spirit of God to email her. I emailed her one night at like 10 p.m. She emailed me right back and said, I'm going to do it right now. She went online and gave $10,000. Right. I got to back up and tell you another story before all of that went down. I know. Right. These this no, normally I'm here talking about Judah and it sounds depressing. This time it's like, this is awesome. You tell a miracle story. So two weeks ago, I can't remember the date. Um, I was asked to speak at an event for a prominent American family at a at a golf outing that they had. And so because. I got asked to do it. I said, yes, before I remembered that I'm a proclaimer of the gospel, right? And so I said, yes, and then I recognized I'm at a golf tournament. I'm not, I'm not supposed to be preaching at a golf tournament. I'm supposed to, like, talk about their thing, which I know very little about. <laughs> so I'm like, you know, I just say yes to the speed engagement. I shouldn't be speaking <laughs> at this thing. And so I go, Lord, you gave me the floor. Like, what do you want me to do? Um, a lot of y'all know Jesus. How many of y'all grew up in church? I'm, I'm not asking if you saved yet, but if you grew up in okay, cool. I just want to give you the picture of what he told me to do. He told me to speak to them on the tabernacle. Now you laughing because you know that's the worst thing in the world, right? I get 
all of it. I get a free shot down the field from some of the wealthiest people for some of the wealthiest people on the planet. And I'm in front of 20, 30, or 40 of them. And God says, I want you to talk to them about the tabernacle. And I'm like, this ain't Sunday school, man. Like, I'm, I'm in front of you. If I bomb this, this is bad. God, I need you to do something. So he's like, no, I want you to preach on the tabernacle. I'm like, for real? Like, this is a golf outing. I'm preaching on the tabernacle and golf outing. God, have you lost your mind? Like, give me something else. A healing something. So he will not leave me alone. Tabernacle, 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 tabernacle. Cool. So I go and I preach on the tabernacle because that's what he told me to do. As I finish, this lady, I go sit down at my chair. The event ends. This lady runs up to me and goes, y'all, this ain't even my event. I'm there preaching for a friend of mine because he asked me. She runs up to me and goes, I'm giving 20,000. You're so inspiring. Now, I just want to remind you, I know the date. It was September 29th, right? We hadn't got all these checks I was just telling you about. It was September 29th. That, that, that dinner we had was on September 4th. Very few checks had rolled in. I think we had raised maybe $15,000. This lady runs up to me for not even my event and says, I'm giving 20,000 today. And I'm like, for real? Like, what was that on September 4th when I was actually speaking for our thing? Like, what is happening? And the Lord says, hey, man, what is this about? I just wanted to show you, I had you speak at a golf tournament on the tabernacle, and I moved this lady's heart to give. I can do that for you, too. It's not about you. It's not about city kids. It's about my name being known. That's what it's about. It works in a collaborative way. So then all these checks start rolling in, and I'm like, man, I was not expecting this. Isn't that how God works? Right? So you're sitting here freaking out on God, acting like he doesn't care about you, I'm talking to me too. When he actually does, not only does he, he's going to answer in some way that you have to scratch your head and go, man, you are, you're God, and I, and I never should have questioned you, just like he did with the speeding of the 4,000. Now, here's the thing. 4,000 get fed. Pharisees come seeking a sign. Verse 13, um, Jesus left them. And getting, to the, getting into the boat, he departed to the other side. The disciples had forgotten to get bread, and they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. So he said to them, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they said amongst themselves, Jesus is saying this because we have no bread, right? Homie, he just did the 5,000. He just did the 4,000. Oh, what is wrong with y'all? That's what I want to say. But then I know I know what I do in my private life. I just told you all stories and I still will go, God, what are you doing? Listen to this. Jesus, being aware of what they were saying, said, why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not perceive or not yet understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? Do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many baskets full of fragments did you take up? They said 12. And when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets of fragments did you take up? Seven. How is it that you still don't understand? Here's the last part. Jesus is calling. So he's compassionate. He's collaborative, but he's calling you to trust him. There's a man from Bethsaida who's a blind man. Jesus heals him. Jesus then, when he comes to Caesarea Philippi, verse 27, he says to the disciples, who do men say that I am? Some. Uh, they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others say one of the prophets. He said, but who do you say that I am? Peter said, I believe you are the Christ. And he strictly warned them not to tell anyone. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed. And after that, he would rise on the third day. He spoke this word to them openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Here's the last part of this Jesus is calling. When he had called the people to himself, his disciples also, he said, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it um, because he's losing it for the gospel. For what will it profit a man if he gains the entire world and loses his own soul? What will a man give in exchange for his own soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Jesus, with these disciples and with people present, gives them the secret to his calling. And his calling is very simple. If you want to follow him, you have to live the same life he lived. He gave up heaven to be here in order that you might have relationship with him. It's that simple. In fact, the story of the gospel 
is that there's a king who created a world where he wanted his people to live in harmony with him. He wanted a people for himself. And so he creates a man and a woman, a prince and a princess, and they choose to not have the king. They choose to disobey his one command because he has a law, and they choose to reject the king. And then Israel comes along, right? Jacob is his name, which means subplanner, and he renames him Israel, which happens to mean prince. And so Adam was a prince that rejected God. Jew, J Israel, a prince that rejects God. And then there's a, another prince that comes, the prince of peace, Jesus. Who then makes a way for us not only to be creatures, but to be children in relationship with God, where he is our God and we are his people. That's what he wants for you. That's what he wants from you. And that's what it's about. Peter was like, man, you're not about to establish your kingdom and certainly you won't die. Peter wanted to be a friend to him, or that's what he thought, but Peter wasn't recognizing, no, man, this is the plan for the prince to die so that the kingdom can be built and the king can have the kingdom that he's always wanted. So you don't really care about what God wants. You care about what you want. It was a great reminder when I walked into my office this morning and I saw that $25,000 sitting on my check. Oh, wow. Saw the $25,000 check sitting on my desk. I felt like the Lord was like, hey, man, I could do this all day. I could give you all of these. And all of these people could write you checks. Well, you never need to go raise money. But why, would you trust me if I did? Would you talk to me? If I took care of every single need that you have all the time, would you talk to me? Would you trust me? Would you love me? Or would I become like a sugar daddy in an ATM machine to you? Right? And I was convicted because I was like, you know what, Lord? I always tell my mom this today. I told y'all raw thoughts. I was telling my mom this today. I used to pray for opportunity to do the things that I do now. And the Lord would not allow me to have an opportunity. In 2017, when my son Judah got sick, I no longer cared about absolutely anything but Jesus. And even, and even Jesus, some days I was like, man, forget this. <laughs> right? If I'm going to be completely honest with you. I think as a Christian, the more I grow, there's this growing tension between wanting to love God with everything I have and wanting to punch him in his face. Like that is my relationship with God. Not trying to sound sacrilegious. I'm just being real with you. That's me. There are some days where I'm like, Lord, I love you. There are other days where I'm like, yo, that thing Jacob did where y'all got to wrestle. Like, I don't really want to do that. But if I could do that, I, I just want to do that once. Right? The reason that I'm saying what I'm saying is Jesus has communicated to me that often I make what I'm doing about what I'm doing instead of about him. And so the Lord, as I was telling him to my mom today, when Judah got sick, all of a sudden, I didn't care about this. I didn't care about that stuff anymore. I didn't care about who I got to speak in front of. I didn't care about money. I didn't care about nothing but Jesus and him crucified. And then all these opportunities started coming. And I was like, well, why am I getting opportunities now? Now I got to stand up in front of people, be vulnerable, talk about how much it hurts every day to watch my son suffer. I didn't want to do that. This never was about you. And there are some of you that are begging God for the opportunity and you're saying, God, you need to take care of this. And he's saying, no, I'm going to take care of you. But understand, I'm calling you to this place for me. I'm not calling you for you. This is not about you. And it's not about your success. Even if it comes, it's still about me. Always has been, always will be. And if you don't want that, you don't want the last thing Jesus said. He said, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him. Which means your life becomes about him. Everything in life becomes about him. If he means anything to you, he's got to mean everything to you. Otherwise, you're going to treat him like an ATM. Hey, God, look, I'm going to church. Hey, God, look, I'm praying. Hey, look, God, I'm on the field, like, pointing up to you. Like, I need you to hook me up. And he's like, oh, no, I think you forgot who the master is, and you're the servant, right? Like, your job is to glorify me. My job is to take care of you. And God is taking care of you talking to me too. God is taking care of me. But it may not feel like it. Don't trust your feelings. They get you pregnant. Okay? Make sure that in everyday life you're thinking more. Some of y'all are going to hear that in like 15 seconds and start laughing. Um, just make sure in life you're laying your desires down in front of Jesus to say, this is about you. This is not about me. And then you'll see what he can do. Like for real, see what he can do. Father, in Jesus' name, help us to know that that's what you're doing. That's how you're working. I pray that you would help us to see you clearly, help us to rest in you, to know that you are working on our behalf, that you are God and that we are not. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would help me to always focus 
on the fact that you're not just doing miracles for my sake. You did miracles in my life. So when I stand up and talk about them now, whoever is listening to me can understand that if you did it before, you can do it again. You're working now just like you did in Scripture in so many ways. You're still doing miracles. And I thank you that you've done it in my life. I ask your forgiveness for when I do not think about them. When I'm walking on that $20 million property that you gifted to us, and I'm looking at the roofs of the buildings, and I'm looking at the road and the things that need to be paid for still or be fixed just to keep them in working order and good shape. And I'm looking at you as if you've forgotten about giving it to us. And that's the dumbest thing I can possibly do. You care about that more than I do. Help all of us to know that that's true. In Jesus' name, head down. Eyes closed real quick. If you're a leader in FCA, have your head up. If you're not a leader here,